last time I was here, I presented on a lot of the research that FAO had been doing with UNICEF, looking at what are the, the impacts of social cash transfers, the recent uh, generation of social cash transfer programs in Sub-Saharan Africa on agriculture. And, um, and that forms part of the, the presentation today. And actually, I, I took the SOFA, the State of Food and Agriculture, that was published by FAO last um, November on social protection and agriculture. And I kind of modified it to address what I thought were the objectives of this meeting. And so I hope I can, uh, I hope that works. So this, this is the basic punchline of what I want to talk about um, uh, this afternoon. Um, first, that despite re recent progress over the past few decades in terms of reducing poverty and hunger, almost a billion people still live in extreme poverty, and almost 800 million are still hungry. Okay, so it's a, it's a serious problem, um, and it's the one which we're trying to address in terms of the, the sustainable development goals, number, number one and two. Both extreme poverty and hunger are increasingly concentrated in Sub-Saharan Africa, South Asia, and in rural areas. Um, and I think the, the history of the past few decades has shown us that economic growth is necessary um, to reduce hunger and, and poverty, but it's certainly not sufficient, and it needs to be inclusive uh, to, be, uh, to reach the poorest, um, which really hasn't been over the past few decades. Um, I think our, my main punchline is that both social protection and targeted agricultural programs are necessary in order to make growth inclusive and to break the cycle of rural poverty and to reach the SDGs uh, well, number one and two. Um, as well, the both so social protection and complementary programs, including agriculture, are necessary um, to address malnutrition, right? which, which is somewhat different than, than, than just that. Um, finally, a very important point, um, which is one which is often overlooked, but I think is crucial to understanding the, in, the, the linked nature of agriculture, social protection, and uh, malnutrition, is that given the nature of poor rural households in low-income countries, we cannot separate livelihoods from food security and nutrition and from social objectives, okay? So those are my punchlines, okay? Now, one main point I wanna make is, uh, is why agriculture is still so important uh, to reducing hunger, okay? I'll use the example of Sub-Saharan Africa, where I think it's, in terms of regions, it's the most important, it's also similar in other regions um, um, to, to, to a different extent. So in, in Sub-Saharan Africa, on average, agriculture still constitutes about a third of GDP, Two thirds of the population um, depend on agriculture for their livelihoods, so it's, it's crucial for people's livelihoods. Women comprise about 50% of the labor force in agriculture, and 60% of employed women are, are in agriculture. And importantly for food security is that families produce a large share of their own consumption. So basically, people are left to their own devices to assure both uh, their, their survival and livelihoods as well as their food, their food security. The future of Sub-Saharan Africa is more reliance on agriculture, not less. Okay, so agriculture is important for, for, for the future. On the one hand, growth originating in agriculture tends to be two to three more times as effective in terms of reducing poverty as growth outside of agriculture. Most of the decline in global uh, rural poverty can be attributed to better conditions in rural area rather than just the outmigration of the poor. And then finally, South Africa, in a, in a very important way, remains poor because of the failure culture over the past few decades. And there's a number of reasons behind this, both environmentally, institutionally, and particularly in terms of public policy that we can't do today. Um, but agriculture is, agriculture is important. In terms of food security and poverty, um, many countries in Sub-Saharan Africa still are, are must feed themselves, um, basically. Um, increasing, increasing and stabilizing domestic food security is fundamental for uh, food security. And really, the, pr the productivity of food staples is, is a key to economic growth. Okay, so it's really getting back to the fundamentals is, is still important. Kickstarting poverty reduction requires accelerated growth and staple, out, staple, output, staple outputs uh, on small family farms. So this is all about increasing productivity, profitability, and sustainability of, of small farming within an ongoing process of structural transformation. Okay, that's the modernization of agriculture and um, uh, the development of the economy. Other regions, and of course, some sub-regions within the, the, uh, the continent itself, Maybe farther along the process of structural transformation, which means that the rural non farmer economy plays a stronger role. Uh, but basically, the, the story I think is, is similar. Um, the key role that agriculture still has to play. Now, very quickly, what is social protection? Just so we're more or less on the same page. It's a set of interventions whose objective is to reduce social and economic risk, and vulnerability, and to alleviate extreme poverty and deprivation. We talked about three broad types of programs. One would be social assistance, which is the most commonly heard one. 
uh, which is a publicly provided unconditional or conditional uh, in-kind or cash transfers, public work, works programs. These are probably the most common types of programs, particularly for the rural poor around the world. There's social insurance, as well as there, there's different kinds of labor market, labor market programs. Okay? We'll really be focusing today on the social assistance um, um, types of programs. Around the world, some 2.1 uh, billion people receive some form of social protection, but really coverage is lowest in the regions with the highest levels of poverty. And this is particularly um, uh, rural areas of Sub-Saharan Africa and, and South Asia. So there's been great improvement, again, over the past decade or two, particularly in, in Sub-Saharan Africa, but there's still a long way to go in terms of scaling up uh, national programs um, uh, in rural areas um, particularly. Now, what is the role of social protection? in terms of reducing poverty and hunger, okay? Just very broadly, and then we'll get into some more detail. First and foremost, social protection reduces poverty. Estimates made by the, the World Bank um, that in 2013, social protection pro, uh, measures prevented some 150 million people around the world from falling into poverty, okay? So there's a clear role in terms of, of reducing poverty. It does that directly just by giving cash, increasing people's incomes, but also ind indirectly by increasing the income generating capacity of, of beneficiary households. It also plays a very important role in terms of increasing resilience and managing risk, okay? So that's just helping households deal with uh, shocks, uh, both at the household level, the individual level, or at the regional level that they have to deal with. And people have to remember is that, you know, the vast majority of, of poor households in rural areas do not have insurance, okay? Insur insurance does not exist, and so often uh, um, social protection plays that role of, uh, of, of helping households manage, manage risk, okay? Um, Social protection programs also reduce food insecurity and seasonal hunger. This is primarily through increasing the quality and the quantity of food consumed uh, and increasing um, dietary diversity. And very importantly, being a, having a social protection system in existence, in place, allows governments to react better in times of, of crisis um, at national and, and, and regional levels. Okay? Now, one point I want to make is that social protection is not the magic bullet that can't do everything, okay? And in fact, um, social protection itself is unlikely to um, uh, lead to improved nutritional status, okay? Um, and so I'm starting from kind of some of the things that social protection can't do. And I think the, some of the um, evidence that uh, we've been working on over the past five or six years in, with unconditional cash transfer programs in Sub-Saharan Africa shows that there are no impacts of these programs or very few impacts on the... Uh, on the status of children, on the nutritional status as measured by anthropometrics, um, um, and so from a number of countries. And it's a similar story from conditional cash transfers in Latin America. These programs, um, in and of themselves, have a difficult, um, uh, aren't able to really address nutritional status. Now, why is that? Okay. Now, those of you who are, who are well versed in nutrition will know that the determinants of nutritional status are quite complex. Okay. It involves care, it involves sanitation water, disease, um, the environment, um, as well as, as food in, uh, intake. And there's often we, you know, weak health uh, infrastructure in, in isolated rural areas. And I think even the evidence that we're beginning to see from the region, we see that in fact, sometimes you see the impact when you have some of these other um, determinants um, uh, interacting with the, so with, the, with the social cash transfer programs, whether it's higher education of a mother or whether it's a protected uh, water source um, in the health household, et cetera. Okay, so the point here is that Nutri nutritional status is determined by much more than just uh, the cash from a social protection program. And so when you look at the links between social protection and um, nutrition, it's really one key component um, in, in um, the, the set of determinants of, of reducing malnutrition, okay? And it's around access and, and basic causes, okay? This comes from Lancet series on maternal and child nutrition where they make a point, right? They make the point also that nutrition-specific programs are actually not enough to reduce nutrition, but you also need to address the root causes of poverty um, and social inequality in order to get at nutrition, okay? So th there's no one program that is going to, to reduce nutrition. You have to bring together a series of different programs. So the, the green here are the nutrition-sensitive programs. So this would be agricultural programs, food security programs, social safety nets, et cetera, that we're talking about today. In the blue, you have the nutrition-specific uh, interventions. And together, sorry, together they um, you get this up here, which is um, an optimal level of, ch of child nutrition. Okay, so you need these two sets of programs. And it's here 
with these circles uh, along the, the green line where social protection can play a role. Okay, so it's in terms of food security, it's in terms of access to, to feeding and caregiving resources, and then finally, um, access to, to use and of uh, health services. Okay, so this is where social protection comes in in terms of the aspect, access aspects of these determinants of, of nutrition. So how does social protection actually address these underlying causes of malnutrition? Um, here are some of the, the factors which influence uh, that, that impact. And over here, with these plus signs, this, this is the evidence, particularly from Sub-Saharan Africa, but also other regions of the world, in terms of how strong the, the empirical evidence and actually on the role of these factors in terms of, of nutrition. First is the reducing poverty and increasing purchasing power, which comes from the uh, um, social protection programs. The enhancement of household productive capacity, again, increasing the quality and quantity of food consumption, the mitigating the negative impacts of shocks, enhancing women's empowerment, which is also very important from these programs, increasing demand for health and education services, reducing morbidity, and then increasing um, child uh, material welfare. So these are kind of all the a number of the underlying factors of malnutrition which are impacted by, by social protection programs. Now, social protection itself can be made more nutrition sensitive, okay? Because the vast majority of social protection programs um, tend not necessarily to, to have a specific focus on nutrition. But in fact, um, you can make them, you can add things onto the programs to make them more nutrition sensitive if this is among the objectives of your program, okay? So first and foremost is having explicit objectives around nutrition as part of the initiative. The second would be targeting, and so focusing the program on those key moments of uh, um, that can most impact nutritional status, such as the, the LEAP 1000 program in Ghana, which focuses on the first 1,000 days of a, of a child's life. You can have complementary nutrition-specific components, such as micronutrients for small children, uh, education, capacity building, and then very important is the messaging and promotion that goes, goes along with the social protection programs. So these are a number of things that can be added into social protection programs in order to enhance the, um, the nutritional impact. Now, Social protection also has very important implications for livelihoods, okay? And which is key because it actually feeds back to food security and nutrition and to other social objectives, okay? Now this is actually one point which is a bit more complex and actually isn't often um, understood or addressed. It is something that we've been particularly focusing on and that was the focus of this project we were working on which was going from protection to, to production. So let me, let me explain what I mean. Okay, so first, why are livelihoods important for social protection? Again, social protection programs typically are done by the ministries of social development, usually have social objectives. So why would, I, why would a household's livelihoods, you know, what they do to, uh, to, to, to you know, earn their living would be important for social protection? In Sub-Saharan Africa, most of the beneficiaries are rural, they're in, in agriculture, and they work for themselves, okay? They produce crops, um, have livestock, they're very traditional levels of technology, low levels of modern inputs, and they produce uh, staples. And basically, most of this is consumed on farm. We have low levels of productive assets, a few hectares of land, a few animals, et cetera, a few years of education. They're often engaged in casual wage labor, um, such as Ganyu labor in Malawi. And a large share of children work on the family farm. Okay, so their, their livelihoods are based on the family enterprise, which is most often um, agriculture. Now, the key point, though, is that most of these, these households are actually living and working in a context of missing markets, or markets which don't function very well, okay? And what that does is it actually links the production and the consumption, okay? So you can't separate what you're doing to produce your livelihood from what you're doing to, in terms of consumption, in terms of what you're eating, and in terms of what you're spending your, your, your money on, okay? Now, why is that? So most of the, in a lot of the context, you have credit, failure, you have insurance, labor, and input market failures, where households aren't able to get the insurance they need, they don't have credit, they're, they're liquidity constrained, okay? What this does is that it constrains economic decisions in investment, production, labor allocation, risk taking, and it means that households tend to focus on safety first instead of profit maximization, right? So they're focusing on survival today instead of looking to the future, all right? So they focus on the production of corn so they have enough to eat instead of diversifying their production, instead of investing in their, ch in their children's education because they're, they're, they're concerned about survival. They're not concerned about the future, basically, right? Um, and so the implications are, for the social side, is that you can't, you can't disentangle this from what households are doing in their livelihoods. And this comes out in terms of labor allocation, in terms of what adults and children do with their time. Um, 
including uh, domestic chores and caregiving. Um, it has to do with intra-household decision-making, investment in schooling and health, whether you're going to send the kid to school or not. It has a lot to do in terms of what you eat or what you don't eat, um, what you produce, what kind of dietary diversity you have, and nutrition, and the kind of negative risk coping st strategies that you, um, that you use. Um, and so we find from the evidence uh, from, from uh, Sub-Saharan Africa that, in fact, social protection actually has big impacts on livelihoods because it's, it's relaxing some of these um, constraints. And so there's long-term effects of improved human capital on nutritional and health status. There's an increase in on, on and off-farm investment and production because we, they relax these constraints brought on by market failure, particularly insurance. It helps holds, households manage risk. And it strengthens social networks and these informal insurance mechanisms, where the, which are the historical way in which um, households in Sub-Saharan Africa, for example, it's the first line of defense in terms of dealing with shocks and with problems is your neighbors and your friends in the, in the local community. Oops. Um, very importantly, the social protection also, also um, strengthens livelihoods instead of fostering dependencies. And so it influences labor choices, but it do not, does not reduce work effort. They work differently, not less. But they tend to not work in agricultural wage labor, but they tend to work on the farm, and children work less and go to school more. There's also, I'm almost done here, there's also very important impact in terms of um, boosting demands for locally uh, made goods and services and creating community infrastructure. And so the studies we did in Ghana, for example, found that for every dollar that was spent on the cash transfer program in, in the community in Ghana, we had the $2.5 in terms of income, income multipliers. And public work programs themselves also provide important infrastructure and, and community assets. Okay. What makes social protection programs effective? Uh, our research, research shows that it has to do with sufficiently large transfer levels, being regular and predictable so households know when they're going to be getting this, this, these transfers, knowing who to target and how to reach them, the importance of messaging, the design and implementation, and of course, focusing on, on women. Um, finally, um, to bring this all together, um, the point I want to make is that really you need to bring together social protection and agriculture as part of a strategy of, of rural development. Social protection does a lot, but it can't do everything. It deals with access and it deals with risk. But in order to address um, malnutrition, it requires additional nutrition-specific complementary measures. In order to address poverty and food security in the long term, it requires agricultural programs and social services to rack, relax uh, structural constraints. And again, as the economy develops, it's also important to, to remember the rural non-farmer economy exception. Okay? So ultimately, eliminating poverty, food security, and malnutrition requires long-term, predictable package of social protection and, and complementary measures. There we go. Thanks. Thank you very much. Excellent. Thank you for this very informative presentation. And please stay with me, because we are opening now to colleagues um, on screen, as well as here in the room. And I'm checking with my colleagues in the back. Do we have questions from our colleagues uh, who are sitting either in Germany or abroad on their screens and would like to get into touch now with Benjamin Davis? This is the one and only opportunity. And I see that I can go here and ask, are there any questions, colleagues here sitting in Germany, that you would like to pose to Benjamin Davis, who made a very strong point on the role of social protection in addressing food insecurity, improving livelihoods of people, and ending hover, hunger and poverty. Sorry. Are there any questions? Don't be shy. Come over, hand the microphone to Nikos from Social Protection. Yes, thank you. Hi, my name is Nikos from the Global Program on uh, Social Protection. I have a question, uh, Benjamin. You, you mentioned that GDP growth in agriculture is much more effective in poverty reduction. Can you give me some or ask some more explanations why this is so and you know how, how it works? Could we collect a few sure. questions? Any other question for Benjamin? If not, then please. Okay. Yes, my name is Elke Kessmann from the social protection team with Inge. Um, Benjamin I'm, I'm sure you have talked to a lot of more of ministries of agriculture and social protection around Africa than I have. So I would, I mean, I would be interested to hear a little bit from your side. How does all of this, how the, uh, all these insights, how, how does that resonate with, with the political decision makers in our partner countries? I have one question I would like to add. 
you mentioned also in the presentation, uh, Benjamin, that uh, social protection can be made more nutrition sensitive. Is it evidence-based? Can you give us further explanation on this, how this can uh, happen? Okay, so these are some good questions, right? So I think in terms of why is GDP growth more effective in agriculture, and I think that has to do a lot with the fact, well, one is that um, in general, a larger share of the poor are involved in agriculture, basically. And so if we're able to get productivity improvements in, in agriculture, it's, it's generally going to affect, uh, uh, it's have a different distributional effect than if it focuses on other sectors, which may have a much you know, smaller share of, of the poor that, you know, participating in, in the value chain of, of, of a different sector. Right? These, partic these particular studies come from, uh, well, some of, the, some of it comes from the studies of, of China, right? Which, uh, in, um, which in a way is, it's a particular case, but it's also a very illustrative case in terms of how you can make reforms in the agricultural sector, which can drive a lot of change you know, throughout the economy, basically, right? Um, uh, but, I, but, I, but, but the logic is more around just the importance of agriculture in terms of the livelihoods of poorer households, right? Uh, which continues to be that way. And I think, the, in a way, the, the, a lot of the processes of structural transformation and kind of the difference, when you look at differences in different, different kinds of country it, and, and how that's occurred in kind of the distributional nature in, in rural areas in terms of access to assets and land gives an idea that it's not, it's not automatic that agriculture is always going to be you know, have that because it, could, it it also depends a lot on the on the on the access to land and you know, the particular structure of, of tenure and, and and what have you. Right. Um, in terms of the second question, this this question is actually fundamental to all the the work that that we've been doing because the original reason we started looking at the relationship between social protection and agriculture was a, because there was a there was a perception, particularly of of development partners like UNICEF that there was a lot of resistance to social protection programs in sub-Saharan Africa, well, frankly, around the world. You hear it everywhere, right? That social protection leads to dependency and laziness and what have you, right? Um, and it's particularly strong in, uh, in sub-Saharan Africa. And, you know, ministries of the economy, they view social protection as a charity and not as, as development, basically. And so that's what drove the whole reason why we did this, spent the last five or six years doing this research. And so... And I think the most interesting thing that came out of this research is that we just, we just published a book, in fact, which has a number of case studies looking at what has been the role of the, this evidence generation in the policy debates and in the program implementation in these countries. And you find that bringing out all this evidence around the economic impacts of social cash transfer has actually broadened the audience and broadened the political support for these programs in a number of countries, right? And so we've actually documented that political economy story in the countries where we, we were doing that. And so, if there was one really concrete impact of all this evidence was that it really impacted the, the, the political discussion in country and brought in the audience. And so, not, so not, and they love this like multiplier stuff, right? I mean, the Ministry of the Economy saw, okay, immediately there's, there's something more than just charity. You can see that it's actually um, um, leading to, uh, um, uh, I mean, it has a lot of spillover effects on, on, on other parts. In terms of the, the evidence base on nutrition-sensitive social protection, there is some evidence base. I think a lot of it is more just kind of on uh, logic and, and, and kind of understanding. One is understanding why you don't see a lot of impact when you, or you see minimal impact when, um, and if you look at the Lancet series, you know, the, 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 you know there's impact of a lot of, nutri of nutrition-specific interventions, but um, you know, scaling those up wouldn't lead to an elimination of, of the problem, right? And so, um, there is some evidence around combination of certain programs, which 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 has enhanced, you know, in, in Lesotho, for example. Actually, we were working uh, uh, with DFID and the government in terms of linking social protection with kitchen gardens, for example, right? And when when you actually li linked the social cash transfers with the kitchen gardens together, this there actually was a larger impact than this just doing them separately, right? Um, which had clear impacts for for food security. You know, the 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 problem is, is that there hasn't been a lot of, uh, of experiments which separate out the nutrition-specific part from the cash part. So if you look at you know, the famous Oportunidades program in Mexico, or Progresa, they actually had nutrition-specific elements to it for small children, but they didn't separate it out in the intervention. So it's hard to know what was impacting, whether it was the cash or the, or the nutrition-specific. Another question? Another question from the Another question. Thank you very much. You talked about the spillover effects. Could you explain a bit more in detail what happens when you give cash to the poorest? What happens in the local market? 
I mean, basic, basically, the, the idea is that, I mean, there's different kinds of spillover effects, right? Um, the one that I talked about here were, was looking at the, the income multiplier uh, effect of, of these programs. And to do that, we actually had to create uh, uh, models of the local economy in order to be able to, to simulate and estimate what is the, this, this local in income multiplier. And the idea is basically that people get cash, right? These are the poorest households. They, they don't, what they do with that cash is basically buy food first and then they buy other goods. Most of those goods and services they actually buy within the community, right? They buy it typically from households who aren't the poorest. They're the ones who have the shop, who have the store, or are somewhat better off, right? And so when all that money is being spent, they're, you know, they're gaining profit basically from, from, uh, from, that, um, from that cash. Now, the amount of the, the multiplier depends on how much of, of that uh, goods and services are produced locally and how much is brought from the outside, basically, right? And so the more which is produced locally means that you're gonna have a higher income uh, multiplier, basically, right? And so um, what this means is that, and, and, and you can observe this when you go into a community in any case, right? You see people get the money, then you know a market pops up around payday, and people are buying goods and services, right? And so you can see that there is at least, you know, that in that moment, there's um, an economy is being is being sustained, right? Um, but I think the 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 message, but so that's part of the message, right? Um, that's part of the the spillover. There's also the spillover in terms of. Um, for example, we did a lot of research looking at what is the impact of these programs on the on the informal social networks, which are very important in much of rural sub-Saharan Africa, right? Again, these are the networks which are the first, people's first line of defense when someone gets sick or they need money or what have you, right? And there's a lot of concern that, okay, how are these gonna you know, destabilize these informal networks, right? And a lot of these programs were grew up in the context of the HIV epidemic and the, and the feeling that these informal networks were being strained, right? And what we found actually, particularly in terms of the qualitative field work that we did, is that these, the, these programs actually strengthened a lot of these networks, right? Because it allowed the poorest of the poor, those who've been marginalized for a long time, to be participate as equals, again, in these networks, which are you know, informal social networks of reciprocity. Um, it allowed them to be as equals. It actually kind of sped up the, the transfers among these social networks. They were able to give something back, actually, right? And so... Um, in a way, that's another kind of spillover, is that it actually kind of strengthened these informal networks and, um, that exist among both the beneficiaries and, and the non-beneficiaries. Right? And then there's been a lot of research around spillovers on education, and you know, the, the good example of you see all of a sudden these beneficiaries buying uni uniforms for their children or shoes, then there's kind of this spillover of, of a good example. Right? Half a minute to you, sure. to <laughs> the most important final statement from your points you've taken. Sure. Well, okay, well, I'll just I'll make two quick points in 30 seconds. The first is, is that I definitely, mean, from my point of view, there are some very important niches in terms of, of where uh, you could have a very strong impact. And I think a lot of it is identified here. It's basically this, uh, this agenda of, I mean, cash transfers have been well documented, right? And they're, they're beginning to scale up. But there's a whole agenda around how to link them to other services, whether it's in livelihoods, agriculture, whether it's in nutrition. And I think there's a lot to do in terms of pilots, in terms of ev evidence generation, and helping governments scale those up nationally. For me, that's big. And so choosing one area and focusing on that could have a big impact. I think secondly, just really quick, is I think, I th and this is an important question for you, because I hear it, there's a for me, the key, it's much better to have a scaled up imperfect program than a perfect pilot, basically, right? And so, and, and I think a discussion around conditionality and how viable conditionality is in some contexts, like in Kenya, like in Malawi, I re, I, conditionality will not be viable in, in Malawi in the foreseeable future. And so, and I think the evidence shows that messaging can be almost and just as strong as conditionality. And so I think we need to think very clearly about you know the, what you can get with an imperfect program, which is feasible, scaled up, versus what you're going to have with the perfect program with the perfect incentives, but it's never going to be scaled up in our lifetimes, basically. Thank you very much. <laughs> Aim high, but be realistic and pragmatic. This is what I take from your final comment. And with this, I would like to thank you all for your presentation.